can you really live without carbs? I mean, seriously, think about it. That bowl of rice, maybe a banana for energy, mm -hmm. even, you know, cake. Mm -hmm. Are these things absolutely essential or could we just cut them out right. and still be okay, still thrive? Right. That's the big question we're tackling today. We're going deep into your body's like fundamental needs and how surprisingly adaptable it can be. Yeah, it's pretty amazing from a biological standpoint, just how flexible we are. You hear so much about needing carbs, but well, our bodies have these incredible backup plans. Okay. So in this deep dive, we're really going to unpack the science, look at which cells absolutely need carbs, what actually happens in ketosis, mm -hmm. and uh, how the brain adapts. The fascinating stuff. Exactly. And we're not just guessing here. We're pulling this from a, a really detailed discussion from the Institute of Human Anatomy, <laughs> getting into the nitty gritty, the physiology, the anatomy of how we handle carbs. Mm -hmm. So our mission today, understand the science behind needing carbs and figure out if, you know, a super low carb or even no carb life is really sustainable, especially when you throw exercise into the mix. Right. That adds another layer. So first big question then. Are there any cells in our body that just flat out cannot function without carbohydrates? Okay, yeah, foundational question. And the answer is a clear yes. Yeah. Your red blood cells, they absolutely require carbs, specifically glucose, to make the energy they need, which is ATP. Okay, red blood cells. Let's dig into that. These tiny things carrying oxygen everywhere. Why can't they just use fat like other cells might? It's actually quite uh, elegant, a really neat bit of biological design. Mature red blood cells, they ditch their nucleus, and crucially, they ditch their mitochondria. Ah, uh, the powerhouses. Exactly. Mitochondria are where most cells make ATP, using oxygen aerobically from carbs, fats, proteins, but red blood cells, get rid of them, maximize space for hemoglobin for carrying oxygen. Okay, so no mitochondria limits their options for making energy. How do they manage them? They rely purely on something called anaerobic glycolysis. Anaerobic, meaning yeah. without oxygen. Precisely. Breaking down glucose without oxygen, it only gives them a net of two ATP molecules, much less than mitochondria can make, but, well, it's enough for a red blood cell. That makes sense. And it avoids a tricky situation too, right? Mm -hmm. You wouldn't want the cells carrying oxygen to be using the oxygen they're supposed to deliver. Exactly. It's perfectly designed. Their energy making is totally separate from their oxygen carrying job. They aren't stealing the cargo. Huh. And it really underlines how crucial even a little glucose is for just basic survival, doesn't it? Absolutely fascinating. Okay, so red blood cells, non-negotiable need for carbs. Mm -hmm. Got it. What about the big boss, the brain? I always hear it's a glucose hog. You heard right. Brain cells, neurons, they definitely prefer glucose. That's their go-to fuel. Uh -huh. uh, the standard literature usually says around 120, maybe 140 grams of glucose a day. Wow. The exact number might be debated a bit, but the preference is key. It really likes glucose. Preference. It sounds yeah. important. So why does it like glucose so much? Why not just burn fat like, say, our muscles can yeah, good question. It comes down to a few critical things. Now, fatty acids, it's true, they give you way more ATP in the mitochondria, like maybe up to 113 ATP versus just over 30 from glucose with oxygen. A lot more energy. A lot more. But uh, the process is slower. It needs more oxygen, more enzymes. It's more complex. And neurons need speed, right? They're firing off signals constantly. Exactly that. They need ATP replenished fast for those quick electrical signals, glucose metabolism. Yeah. It's quicker even if the yield per molecule is lower. Okay, speed matters. What's well, that? there's also getting the fuel to the brain. Glucose zips across the blood-brain barrier pretty easily. That protective barrier around the brain, it's very selective. Right. Fatty acids, they don't cross nearly as well, so it's just harder for the brain to grab onto fats directly for fuel in large amounts. And wasn't there something about damage, like oxidative stress? Yes, good point. Burning fatty acids tends to create more oxidative stress. Think of it like um, more cellular exhaust fumes, these unstable molecules called free radicals. Right. The brain is sensitive tissue. It's less resilient to that kind of stress than, say, muscle. So you add it all up, yeah. speed of ATP, easy transport, less stress. Glucose wins out for the brain's preference. Okay, so the brain prefers glucose strongly. But what if we, like, drastically cut carbs? Does the brain just sputter out? Not quite. This is where the brain's amazing adaptability comes in. The body has backup systems. The main one is called gluconeogenesis. Gluconeogenesis. Sounds complicated. What is it? Huh. Yeah, it sounds like a mouthful. But basically, it means making new glucose. Your body, mostly the liver, but also the kidneys a bit, can actually build glucose from non-carb stuff. Like what? 
like parts of fats, uh, amino acids from protein. It's a survival mechanism, really. It kicks in when carbs are scarce. The body just kind of reroutes its fuel production. It's incredibly resilient. So our own bodies can make glucose. How much can they make? Enough for the brain. Yeah, it's pretty efficient. Gluconeogenesis can churn out maybe 180 to 220 grams of glucose a day, roughly. That generally covers the baseline need, those red blood cells we talked about, and the brain's minimum requirement. Okay. So technically, you can survive without eating carbs hmm. because your body makes its own. Right. That answers a big piece of the puzzle then. Survival is possible, mm -hmm. but thriving. And what about exercise? That's where keto diets and ketones come in. Yeah. Exactly. Now we get to the next layer of adaptation. If you keep carbs really low for a while, the liver pulls another trick. It starts turning fatty acids into ketone bodies. Ah, the famous ketones. Yep. The main ones are acetoacetate and beta-hydroxybutyrate. It's like the liver switches on this backup fuel factory when glucose is low. And these are what people on keto diets are aiming for. How do they help the brain? They have a key superpower. They can cross the blood-brain barrier. Joy. And neurons can use them. Inside the mitochondria, they get converted into something called acetyl-CoA, which then enters the main energy-producing cycle, the Krebs cycle, to make ATP. So the brain can actually run on ketones. That's a major switch. How long does that take? It's a process and adaptation. Uh, the first 12 to 24 hours of low-carb or fasting, ketone production starts going up. But glucose is still king for the brain. Ketones might only provide maybe five up to 20% of its energy. Still mostly glucose then initially. Yeah, but after maybe three or four days when you're properly in ketosis, blood ketone levels are much higher. Then they can cover maybe 30 to 50% of the brain's fuel needs. Getting significant. Mm -hmm. And if you stick with it, like for weeks or longer, ketones can become the brain's main fuel, providing maybe 60, even 70% of its energy. Wow. The rest comes from that glucose made by gluconeogenesis or any tiny bits of carbs you might still be eating. Okay, so ketones are like this alternative brain fuel. What about muscles and exercise? Can ketones power workouts effectively? Yes. Other cells use them too. Skeletal muscle, especially the uh, the slower twitch endurance fibers, they can use ketones quite well. They also readily burn fatty acids, of course. Right. And this is why lots of people feel good on keto, maybe lose weight. They've shifted their main fuel source. Plus, you often cut out a lot of processed sugary carbs, which reduces overall calories too. It makes sense for just moving around. Heck yeah. But I often hear about issues with keto and like intense exercise. Why is that? You're right to flag that. While keto works well for many, it can pose limitations, especially for athletes or people doing certain kinds of workouts. One factor is just the raw energy yield. Okay. Remember, glucose with oxygen gives you 30 plus ATP. A ketone body gives you just over 20, so slightly less bang for your buck, molecule for molecule. Okay, a bit less efficient. What a really big one is storage. We store glucose as glycogen, right? In our muscles, maybe around 400 grams plus another 90, 100 grams in the liver. That's a ready-to-go fuel tank. Yeah, like reserve power. Exactly. Crucial for longer, harder efforts. Ketone bodies, you can't really store them in muscles like that. There's no big ketone tank waiting. Ah, okay. No immediate reserve in the muscle itself. I can see how that might be a problem for intense stuff. Definitely. And here's another key point. Ketones cannot be used anaerobically without oxygen. Right. You mentioned anaerobic glycolysis for red blood cells. Muscles do that too. Oh yeah. When you push really hard sprints, heavy lifts, your muscles can't get oxygen fast enough. So they rely on that quick, dirty anaerobic glycolysis, breaking down glucose without oxygen for a fast burst of two ATT. Ketones just can't play in that game. So for those really high power moments, like a final sprint in a race, or I don't know, bursts in basketball, yeah. if, you're, if you're only running on ketones, you might just Hit a wall. That's a perfect way to put it, hitting the wall. Yeah. Now, your body does adapt to burn fat and ketones at higher intensities than someone not on keto. But at the very top end, those fast twitch muscle fibers need that anaerobic glucose breakdown. Mm -hmm. Someone on keto can still do intense bursts using glucose from gluconeogenesis and whatever glycogen they have left, maybe helped by a few carbs. But the problem comes with prolonged high intensity. Like a long game or a marathon. Exactly. Those limited glycogen stores just run out much faster. Think of that marathon runner hitting the wall at mile 20, or the basketball player losing steam in the fourth quarter. So if someone loves keto but also loves really intense workouts, what's the advice? Are they just incompatible? Not necessarily incompatible, no, but it often needs careful management, maybe some strategic adjustments. Some people find experimenting helps. Like what? 
like uh, adding back small amounts of carbs, maybe a little bit daily or looking at a weekly average or maybe just timing them specifically around those really tough workouts. Interesting. The idea is to provide just enough extra glucose for those peak efforts, maybe without totally kicking you out of ketosis if staying in ketosis is the goal. Right. Finding that personal balance, which brings us back to the big question everyone asks. Mm -hmm. How many carbs do you actually need? Is there a magic number after all this? Honestly, the real answer after looking at all this complexity is it depends. It's really personalized. Depends on your goals, your activity level, and especially the type and intensity of your exercise. No single number fits all. Definitely not. Now, there is data out there, guidelines for exercisers who aren't on keto, suggesting daily carb amounts to avoid running out of fuel, assuming they get enough protein and fat, too. Okay. And like we just said, for folks on keto hitting energy walls during intense stuff, trying those small targeted carb additions might be the key for them. Okay, let's try and boil this down. For everyone listening, what are the absolute key takeaways from this deep dive? Okay, number one, red blood cells absolutely need carbs. Glucose, no way around it. Got it. Number two, the brain loves glucose. It's the preferred fuel. But... It's incredibly adaptable and can run significantly on ketone bodies if carbs are low for a long time. Adaptable brain. Check. And number three. Yes, you can technically live without dietary carbs because your body can make its own glucose, gluconeogenesis, yeah. and use ketones. But that might not be optimal for everyone, especially if you do a lot of prolonged high-intensity exercise where glycogen and that anaerobic power boost are really important. So it really circles back to knowing yourself, your body, your lifestyle. Precisely. Carb needs are super individual. So the final thought for you listening, now that you know a bit more about how your body handles energy, about red blood cells, the brain, ketones, exercise, how does this make you think about your carbohydrate intake? What sort of fuel mix, you know, might actually be best for your unique needs and goals? Definitely something to mull over. Hopefully this deep dive gave you some clarity. 